Welcome to the Tolden Stone Podcast. I'm Garrett Ryan, and my guest today is Dr. Brett Devereaux. Brett is a historian currently at UNC Chapel Hill, and he's the blogger behind a collection of unmitigated pedantry, a wonderful collection of reflections on ancient history, military history, and the intersections of popular culture with both. Um, So Brett, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, likewise. Um, Really, for someone with my interests, your blog is pretty much catnip. Um, It's just great stuff. And uh, in particular, um, I first discovered it through your long series on the Siege of Gondor, uh, the grand climactic battle of the Lord of the Rings. And uh, this analyzes uh, that battle and siege um, in terms of the realia of pre-modern warfare, um, earning you a reputation, I understand, as the orc logistics guy online. So um, my sympathies, condolences, congratulations, however far that goes. But anyway, um, so you cover most points in great detail, which I much appreciate. But there was one point on which I wished a bit more clarity. And that was, um, in your professional opinion as an historian, uh, how far could a standard Middle-earth battle troll toss an armored Gondor infantryman? Not as far as you'd think, but further than you'd (laughs) hope. Um, (laughs) Right. So uh, this is a question I attack in in the series. Um, what I'm demonstrating just for people is like, why are you even bothering? Um, this is an approach to military history, sometimes goes by the name the physics of the battlefield, where there are a lot of interactions on a pre-modern battlefield that we don't do in warfare anymore um, and that aren't safe to do something experimentally. Things like collisions of cavalry and infantry uh, you know, you can't do, you can't have a block of cavalry smash into a block of infantry. People would get hurt under realistic circumstances. That is indeed the point um, <laughs> under under realistic That's circumstances. Right. And so sometimes what we do as historians is we try to look at the physics behind these interactions to understand what's going on. And so I'm applying this method to the scene that people will remember from the film where the gates of, of Minas Tirith smash open and the troll comes in and is just like golf swinging Gondor soldiers <laughs> out of the way. And, you know, the other thing here, of course, in, in our in our films and, and in video games as well, everything is computer generated. And so things can be kind of weightless. They can move however the CGI animator wants them to. And I ask, is it realistic that the trolls can sort of golf swing guys out of the way? <laughs> um, and the answer is no. Um, uh, you know, grown human being in armor is a pretty heavy object, 250, 350 pounds. Um, is what you're looking at. It takes a lot of energy to accelerate an object that that heavy. Um, and trolls are ex- clearly extremely strong. I think I work with under the assumption that they are 10 times as strong as a, as a mm-hmm. human. Um, so just an order of magnitude more force being generated. Um, and nevertheless, I think they would have to accelerate the head of their hammer faster than a golf swing. Um, to get this guy moving, and it's just that's not that's not in the cards um, at the level <laughs> of forces. Um, that isn't to say that they wouldn't um, wouldn't you know be really. Da- I mean, like you, you don't need to throw someone twenty feet in the air to hurt them, um, <laughs> right? You know, but um, but no, this is a sort of a scene where right because they do you see that they like hit guys and they go flying twenty feet, thirty feet in the air. Um, and uh, no, that's that's not that's not realistic. And of course, trolls are a little bit silly. But part of what was eating at me in that scene is that often you see the same thing in particularly video games, mm-hmm. um, but sometimes also films in interactions with cavalry. That like the cavalry slams and the infantrymen go flying into the air, go flying twenty feet backwards, mm-hmm. and that's just not how that interaction works. That's not how the physics of that interaction works. Um, people have actually. Um, gotten hit by horses at a gallop um, on film. So you can see what happens um, when a lone individual gets slammed into by a horse and they get knocked down, not up. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, not that I would I would suggest seeking out some of this. I mean, <laughs> obviously it's, it, it can be kind of unpleasant, but as a military yeah, historian, right. sometimes engaging with the unpleasant is the, is the, is the cost of doing business. Mm-hmm. Um, but this sort of physics of the battlefield approach is one I wanted to introduce. And I mean, this is the sort of the, the kind of dirty secret behind both the Siege of Gondor series and its companion Helm's Deep series, mm-hmm. um, which is that I'm using the Lord of the Rings to kind of backdoor military history. I'm going to teach you what strategy operations and tactics are, how 
logistics works, how siege warfare works, and so on, um, through essentially a campaign study of a fictional campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was my chance to like, let's do some physics of the battlefield here. Although some of that also comes back when we talk about cavalry. Oh, right. Um, well, yes, well, thank you for explaining. Um, you know, it really was a lot of fun to see, well, in general on your blog, um, to see you interrogate these assumptions, you know, which are often incorrect or misguided, which underpin um, so much of the fiction that seems to be based or purports to be based um, in antiquity or the Middle Ages. And of course, things like the Lord of the Rings are, you know, kind of a pseudo medieval world. It has at least the armor, you know, the armaments, the weaponry of that period. As we kind of see that as an analog of what actually happened during the Middle Ages. So I wanted to think a little more in more, more detail about the Siege of Gondor. Um, so as listeners may recall, and actually I, in the interest of science, rewatched uh, the entire Return of the King um, over the weekend, because again, if someone has to do it, it's a tough job. Um, uh, so th this is um, the climactic battle between the forces of Mordor, this massive army of orcs, mostly, you know, trolls, other fun creatures, um, and, you know, Sauron's allies from the south and east, um, against the allied armies of Gondor and Rohan. And it begins with a huge force of orcs attacking Minas Tirith with various war machines. Um, I think we see, you know, war towers, uh, onagers, all kinds of stuff. And finally breaking the gate with this gargantuan, wolf-headed ba uh, battering ram called Grand. And so in terms of the mechanics um, and logistics of pre-modern warfare, um, how realistic is the siege of Gondor as we see it in the movie? Uh, it's a big question, I know, but yeah. whichever asses you might no, focus it's, on. It's, yeah, so... I think the first the first thing, and I, I do this in the series, is that we have to separate the film and the books. Um, ah, yes. So, uh, and I have these book notes studded through the series mm -hmm. where I'm like, the book diverges on this point. Um, so J.R.R. Tolkien writing the books, um, you know, I talk about he has two great pools of experience that he is drawing on when he is thinking about this. Um, the first is that Tolkien was a professor of old English literature. He knows the early medieval sources, um, has marinated in them in a way, and has an instinctive sense of the plausible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that element of, of the siege, like the way that it's conducted, it's fantastical, it's supersized um, in a lot of ways. But a lot of the things are are basically accurate. The the catapults can't break down the main wall, so we don't bother. We're going to fire deep into the city. Yeah, no, that's how you use trebuchets. Um, mm -hmm. That is what they're for, degrading defenses, but you, you're probably not going to breach a wall with them. Um, the use of siege towers, not to seize the walls, but to overawe the walls, to, con to control them, fire down onto them. Mm -hmm. That's what siege towers are for. Um, you know, he has a good sense of these things. Of course, the other, the other pool of experience he has... Um, is he was a lieutenant in the Lancashire Fusiliers in the First mm -hmm. World War. He fought at the Somme. So he has a pretty instinctive understanding of how battle works. How fast do soldiers march? Um, what sort of mental stresses do they experience? Um, how does that play out? Um, the, the Lord of the Rings can very much be read as, especially Return of the King, can very much be read as World War One literature, mm -hmm. um, you know, alongside, say, All Quiet on the Western Front. Right, right. Um, Peter Jackson does not have either of these things. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, as he's translating, uh, things get muddled. Um, I, I will say the Lord of the Rings films are a triumph of adaptation, but that doesn't mean they're perfect. And so um, there are a few things that, um, that, that, he doesn't get, that he doesn't get quite right um, or that end up a little bit weird. Um, we have this sort of catapult duel early on. Mm -hmm. um, now, defensive catapults on walls was a thing, particularly in antiquity, more so than the Middle Ages, um, which sort of fits Gondor's kind of theme as being sort of this older, more sophisticated society. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't generally use trebuchets, though, um, uh, from castle walls. You can, you can trebuchets fire in a high arc, so you could just mm -hmm. put them behind the wall in the courtyard. That's fine. It will shoot over the wall. Um, though the projectiles they're throwing are silly, the, the destruction there is a little bit silly. Um, you would never have so many. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of um, licenses he's taken. I mean, that said, the overall plan of the battle... Uh, actually makes a, a fair bit of sense. Like what the orcs are trying to do, the witch king who is in command mm -hmm. of them, the Nazgul, um, 
is, is a fairly standard siege attack plan um, where you're going to engage the defenses everywhere in a light sort of way so that forces are insufficient to answer your planned breach. This is, for instance, how uh, Scipio, not yet Africanus, takes New Carthage. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. He sort of faints here, faints there, faints there, and then comes through the marsh with the big attack mm -hmm. um, where they don't see it. And once he's it, once he's through, it's too late to stop him. And so this is a similar sort of plan. It's a sort of recognizable plan. So the the towers and the catapults are all a feint for Grand, the main battering ram that has been purpose built to bring down this gate. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know of siege equipment in the ancient or medieval world ever being, at least not before gunpowder, being purpose built for a specific defense in this way um mm -hmm. with the exception of stuff that was just constructed on site um what i suspect right. tolkien has in mind here um is actually uh belgium in 1914 um, oh yes mm -hmm. the um in the in the period before the first world war the belgians had kind of recognized that belgium was a pretty natural highway between germany and france and that was awkward and in mm -hmm. an effort to discourage anyone from taking that highway um they had picked key um transportation nodes particularly liege um mm -hmm. and fortified them with um you know a ring of fortifications these were very modern um, and the problem for them was that the Germans were aware of this um, in the run-up to the war and had purpose-built artillery pieces that like, oh, you have 12 feet of concrete. Okay, we will build a <laughs> cannon that can crack through 14 feet of concrete. Mm -hmm. And so the German army showed up in 1914 with purpose-built artillery designed to defeat these specific defenses and then just mm -hmm. reduce the forts one by one quite quickly. Um and and so one one feels like Grand is almost the sort of um, you know the equivalent of these heavy German siege guns, mm -hmm. where it is this is a ram that has been you know this gate is otherwise impenetrable. This is a ram that has been purpose built for this gate and this gate only, and that is the main attack. And of course, this being fantasy, um, the way that it has been purpose built is it has had spells of ruin set uh, upon yeah. it. <laughs> um, and it belches fire and, and does all sorts of fun stuff. But um, mm -hmm. but that feels a little more World War I than, mm -hmm. um, than the medieval world. But otherwise, this is part of what made Tolkien so useful to take this approach with, is that the books at least remain relatively well-rooted. Mm -hmm. And so the movies, again, less so, which creates really illustrative contrast where I can be like, Tolkien has this so that it works, and Martin has messed it up in these ways so that it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. um but but tolkien's experience made it really valuable because you know if you get i know we're going to get to game of thrones a little later mm -hmm. if you get a military campaign that just doesn't make any sense that armies <laughs> just teleport around uh you know straight up season seven season eight stuff of game of thrones <laughs> um you're on you're on Greyjoy's teleporting fleet um <laughs> there's nothing i can do with that as sort of uh, military analysis you know mm -hmm. i don't have i don't have tables for how fast you can teleport your fleet across the continent mm -hmm. um whereas i can figure out how fast an army can march um mm -hmm. and in fact i have i have a series talking about that um you know what is, what does it what does it take to move an army mm -hmm. um in a lot of detail um in the sort of world before railroads um but um but tolkien remains rooted enough that this all makes sense and so I would say actually both the Siege of Gondor, but also the assault on Helm's Deep are to me recognizable ways to attempt to storm a fortified settlement mm -hmm. um, where, um, you know, the Siege of Gondor is this sort of almost Roman-esque kind of faint, faint, faint punch mm -hmm. um, with a plan. It's got a lot of catapults. It's got a lot of materiel. Um, and then the assault on Helm's Deep is a very classic medieval style, what we call a hasty assault. Mm -hmm. um, this is the sort of thing where you show up at a at a castle. If you want to, if you sit there and wait the castle out, you're going to be there for months, maybe years. Um, so the first thing you do when you show up is you try and launch a really quick attack before the defenders are ready. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of hasty assault it usually fails, um, but that's the kind of assault. And the mistake that Saruman is making there is that he bet the farm on the low probability assault. Uh, which, as I talk about in the series, I actually think is perfectly fitting with his character. That um, mm -hmm. 
war is hard and Saruman hasn't done it very much and he isn't very good at it. And he's too proud and arrogant to realize that. I'm like, this fits with his character perfectly that he would sort of, you know, I mean, these dummy wummies on horses can do it. How hard could it be? Um, and then he goes and launches a very sort of half-baked assault, whereas the the Witch King's assault on, on Minas Tirith, I think, is actually is quite well put together, right? If if Rohan didn't show up in his rear at the wrong moment, he would have won. And I will point out, this doesn't make it into the movie, but in the books, he has even detached a blocking force to prevent the arrival of the Rohirrim and they have to they have some local guides that lead them sneakily around that army. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um but that the the Witch King has in fact asked the question, right? Presumably some good wargaming and staff work there. What happens if the Rohirrim show up in my rear? And he's like, "Okay, I will detach a blocking force and tell them to to dig ditches and and other defenses across the road so that the Rohirrim will get caught up on those fortifications." And they'll have to engage in a pitched battle. And so they won't show up in time. Um, and that's sort of my solution. And of course, there's no way for him to know that that they're going to sneak around his army through the use of local guides. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so he has a very, he has a sophisticated plan with a lot of contingencies. Um, but it is the kind of plan that you could see a sophisticated um you know, army doing it's it's actually to use another Roman example. It's very um, the Romans in Campania in the Second Punic War. We're gonna have mm -hmm. one army bottle up Hannibal. We're gonna have other armies that are doing, and then we're gonna have another army siege down Capua, um, right. and and hope that Hannibal doesn't show up and mess everything up, which he does at at points. But <laughs> um, it's complex. But this sort um, what we would call operations, the coordination of multiple armies in motion. Hmm. which the Romans sometimes oh. did. <laughs> right. Oh, well, well, thank you. That, that, that's, that's fascinating. Think about, uh, about Grand, for example, as sort of the, the Tolkien's version of Big Bertha or whatever, you know, this big, you know, you know, siege bunker crashing gun. Yeah. Um, or even, I guess, to, to, to use the uh, ancient analogy, like, like uh, you know, Demetrius Paleorcates, you know, and his great, you know, you know, siege towers and that, like, you know, 150 foot long ram he built, you know, to take down Roads and Salamis. You know, with some limited success in there. In that yeah, case. I was gonna say, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. things don't always work out for two. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It looks cool, but yeah, right. Just gets my. To cool be fair, nickname. things didn't work out for the Witch King either. So. Right, right. Yeah, you can have a cool nickname and still fail, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but anyway, so of course, uh, after the siege, you know, despite the best laid plans of the Witch King and you know Gothmog or whatever, um, you know, the Gondor does show up by that devious path in the book. that's kind of charge over the step or whatever in the movie. Um, and then there's this uh, wonderfully cinematic charge where they just mow down umpteen orcs, um, you know, just galloping over the, pretty much the whole orcish army. And uh, you talk at some length about how this is not quite how horses work. No, horses are not battering rams, uh, however much our, our fiction likes to present them as such. And once again, sort of footnote, this is better in the book. Mm -hmm. um, where the battlefield is much wider and there's a lot more sense of maneuver. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, there's this big right. And it's, the scene is awesome, right? I mean, we have to admit, like, it's a huge mm -hmm. emotional moment. The music swells, the horses go forward. And certainly a cavalry charge could be terrifying. Um, but horses, and, and a horse can absolutely trample one person. Um, but it cannot trample 50 people. <laughs> um, you'll occasionally see, I mean, this is an argument that has been has been going um, both among military historians and and enthusiasts for a while, so you'll see quite a bit of it. Um, and in particular, you will see videos of of horses being sort of driven through very thin lines of standing, not resisting infantry, and people are like, "Aha! They can do it!" And I'm like, "It had to knock two guys aside to get through the hole. That's not <laughs> the same as you know infantry in four foot." intervals eight men deep uh with spears that's a different mm -hmm. experience to say the least um yeah the impact of cavalry so i mean you know, to be fair a 1400 to 2000 pound horse hitting you hurts a lot like if, if cavalry physically strikes an infantry line they will do damage that said um that horse is never going to walk again um if it didn't get stabbed and die um, and of course, and the horse is going 25, 30 miles an hour at that collision and the horse comes to a stop. You as the rider are going to continue moving, right? Momentum is conserved. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, 
and uh, and that is going to end up with you being injured in the middle of an enemy formation, um, and very shortly after being either dead or captured. So that is not what you want. Um, now, obviously, cavalry works because people keep using it, and the big thing here is the morale impact of cavalry, that horses thundering towards you they're huge objects if you're the fellow in front you know that a collision is gonna be very bad for you um everything in your brain is telling you to run away infantry in close order that stands its ground can resist cavalry uh, cavalry charges will bounce off of well-disciplined infantry um, typically speaking what happens is is the charge is never delivered that mm -hmm. your knights, they're galloping forward. And if you see these guys aren't moving, that there's this dense block and they're not going anywhere, you're going to wheel aside at the last minute um, and regroup. And then maybe you charge them again. Maybe you try the flanks. Mm -hmm. um, but getting infantry that can hold up like that is is hard. And, you know, Tolkien notes that the, the orcs, you know, quail before the charge and run and then the hooves ride over them. And we see a mm -hmm. little bit of this in the film in that the line just starts wavering before the impact. You know, really, these guys should be turning and running before the impact is what you want. Um, and then you're not trampling them. You're weaving through them, striking with your weapons because mm -hmm. you're much faster than they are um, as the cavalry. But what we see where the horses are just riding over everybody is not is not generally how, how cavalry works. Um, that would be very bad for your horses. And your war horse is really expensive. You want your war horse to get through this battle in one piece, if possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly a battle like this would involve a lot of dead horses. But um, you know, uh, you're 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 right. You're riding your Bugatti Veyron into battle here <laughs> in terms of value equivalent, right? This is your Ferrari. Uh, right. Um, you would like it to come out the other end without too many scratches. Um, these are the most expensive animals. Um, mm -hmm. just spectacularly expensive in some cases. Um, though I can't give you exact figures because it turns out that war horse prices in the Middle Ages were subject to more fluctuation than the price of just about anything else. Um, huh. So it's really hard to give standard figures because at some points, war horses undergo order of magnitude inflation over the course of a century um, where other goods are not changing nearly as much I, I can't tell you why i could just tell you that's what the price data is uh, but yeah so the mechanics of these charges you know often in fiction we have these sort of there's a solid body of infantry and then the course is just sort of battering ram them out of the way you know in, mm -hmm. in practice what you have is the horses are going to ride up at a gallop and try and get the infantry at least some of the guys to start running to break up that tight formation if they can do that then they can ride over it and destroy it if the infantry holds in formation, um, even if they don't have spears, there's often this sort of spear is the anti-cavalry weapon. And spears are wonderful, but you could stop a cavalry charge without spears. The Romans do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, if you can keep that tight formation, if you can keep that density, uh, then it's a, it's a, you're, the infantry is offering the cavalry a suicide pact. You can hit us, and the front rank of guys are going to be really badly injured, but you will all die. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Uh, do you want that bargain? And the cavalry is going to say no and veer off. Hmm. And um, and so that's the sort of the interaction you get, at least as we understand it. Obviously, this is a, to a degree, a physics of the battlefield question because, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you can get a few hundred horses to slam into a couple thousand people uh, safely. <laughs> the other no, thing I, I know, think... oh, go ahead. The, the Rohirrim cavalry formation is deep and tight, which mm -hmm. you never do. Um, horses are fragile creatures, uh, and you also need to be able to maneuver them around obstructions. Um, so generally speaking, cavalry formations are either deep and loose, meaning there are intervals between the, the horses, but you have several ranks behind you, or, and this is certainly should be how the Rohirrim fight, tight but shallow. A single line of horses, stirrup to stirrup all the way across, and then a long interval, and then your next line of horses, stirrup to stirrup all the way across, usually only two or three of these lines. Um, our sources describe things like cavalry placed so tightly that if you threw a glove onto the helmet of one man, it could travel a mile before it touched the ground. 
um, because everybody's just packed in right, right. Um, to provide. Again, think of how intimidating that would be as it's coming at you. But this means that if there's an obstruction, if um, one of the riders is hit and goes down, right, he creates an obstruction. The, the riders that see the obstruction can simply slow down. They'll pull back out of the line. They can maneuver around it and then speed up and resume, try and resume their place or come in behind. Um, and to enable some degree of, but this sort of like giant rectangle of horses moving forward, you can mm -hmm. do that with infantry. You can't do that with cavalry. Horses cannot push on each other. Um, and the front of your horse colliding with the back of somebody else's horse is really bad for the horses. Um, you know, I, I, I stress this that like, I mean, horses are, are, you know, they grew up on, on the Eurasian steppe. They are built for speed. Their legs are powerful and spindly and terribly fragile. Like mm -hmm. a, a horse that steps in a pothole can lame itself for life. Uh, so these are powerful, but, but often fragile creatures. And you don't, obviously, you, you don't want your horse to get lame in the middle of a cavalry charge because it's going to tumble its rider, which is you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, and that's going to be unpleasant. So. Um, so the, the charge we see is cool, but but no, not how they were actually done. Uh, ironically, for a cavalry charging formation, um, the uh, the bit earlier in the movie where Faramir attempts a cavalry charge against infantry in a city, which is a dumb idea. It's just the dumbest idea. <laughs> um, but the scene where he's charging um, actually does the formation about right. It's tight in two lines with the interval should be wider between the two lines, but it's tight in two lines with with a bit mm -hmm. of an interval. Um, rather than this huge, super dense formation, um, in the in the books, Theoden's army is much more spread out. He's moving over the whole of the Pelennor, which is miles and miles and miles wide. Um, so, um, and he's moving in at least three columns. Uh, those lines get weirdly moved into the film, where he's like, "Take your arid this way after you pass the wall." And it's oh, like yeah. there's there's no wall to pass in the books. There is yet one more wall around the city. There's a low wall that surrounds the entirety of the Pelennor. Mm -hmm. And that's the wall that line refers to. He's like, once you're through the breach we've made, turn right and go miles that way and then come back around because he's using the mobility of the cavalry to fill the whole paddle space mm -hmm. um, and and strike the army. So it wouldn't have been anywhere near as as dense. The other issue um, is just generally the terrain that the area around Minas Tirith in the film is open grasslands, whereas Tolkien is really clear this is dense farmlands with lots of little towns. So mm -hmm. uh, you need to be really flexible in your maneuvering your cavalry because there's going to be all sorts of, you know, farmhouses and fences and barns and hedgerows and all sorts of nonsense you have to maneuver around in order to get into attack position. Which is all just no, removed from the film, right? Yeah, just this this barren step of some sort. And you, right, and um, one wonders how on earth they feed this city. Yeah, right. They they, they all outsource it somehow. Yeah, um, you know, thinking about the, these, you know, how how infantry and cavalry, you know, interact in battle. I was reminded when, we, when you were talking about this, the short treatise uh, of Arian uh, about the order of the battle against you know these uh, barbarian step nomads coming down over the Caucasus. And, you know, he's very, you know, it's, it's sort of a uh, kind of a think piece. And I wonder mean, if he actually did this or not. But, you know, he, he says, if I remember it correctly, he begins by saying, you know, have this mighty war cry to kind of scare them off in the beginning and then launch all these missiles. So by the time they get even close to you, they're being, you know, intimidated, you know, struck by all of these projectiles. Um, you know, where cavalry is not, in other words, the super weapon that it seems to be presented as sometimes in, in fiction. Yeah. And he's facing, um, he's facing horse archers. Right, right. Um, the real, step the real horse menace. archers, which yeah. obviously they fight a little bit differently, but I'm going to be frank with you. If you gave me a choice between facing Western European knights or step horse archers, I'd rather fight the knights. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Step horse archers are, are, you know, man for man, probably the mm -hmm. most lethal combatants on, a, on an ancient or medieval battlefield because they can charge home at you, um, but they'll also... And this is why is such emphasis, presumably, on missile weapons. Mm -hmm. um, they'll caracol at you. So the horse archer it, in games, these guys like they sit a hundred yards away from you and like plink at you with arrows. That's that's not <laughs> oh, yes. how this works. Um, uh, scholar Timothy May, I think, really kind of has this about right. Um, the horsemen are gonna f they're in a formation. 
this is deep and loose, by the way. This is where you get deep and loose cavalry formations. Mm -hmm. They're going to come at you at speed. Um, as he's galloping at you, uh, the horseman is firing arrows, um, which is going to create a sort of time on target effect where those arrows are going to arrive in a clustered grouping because he is accelerating forward as he's launching them at progressively lower arcs, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be really unpleasant for you. And then right as he hits about 50, 25 yards away, rather than charging into your still intact formation, he's going to caracal. He's going to wheel his horse around, drop one highly accurate point blank shot on you at a point when his relative velocity is zero at the apex of the turn. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to ride away from you doing the Parthian shot, lobbing arrows right, right. back mm -hmm. at you. And since there are several archers in a line, that's going to be a continuous experience for you. Um, because the moment he's pulled away, the next guy is coming up at you. And it's mm -hmm. clear that it was extremely hard to get infantry to psychologically hold up under this. Um, the temptation to either charge out after the fleeing horseman, who isn't really mm -hmm. fleeing, is intense, or to just run away. And then the moment you start running, these guys ride you down. Um and so, yeah, and, and so Arian is like, I'm going to have a really strong front line of infantry, and then I backed them up with archers and javelins and even catapults that I'm using as field artillery mm -hmm. to counter fire this force and to try and break it up to lessen that morale impact, presumably, um, but also because he knows that these guys aren't going to charge home against him unless they think they can win. Mm -hmm. And then if you keep reading, is like, once I've broken up their impetus... Only then do I unleash my cavalry that has been sitting in reserve. Mm -hmm. Because he has to know that if he sends his agrarian Roman cavalry just straight up against step nomads, they'll just lose and die. Um, so he has, to, he has to let them attack, let their mm -hmm. attack kind of play itself out and not succeed. And then he can counterattack with his horsemen who can match their mobility um, to deliver the decisive um, attack. And this is, that is a way to fight step nomad. It doesn't always work, but that is, you, mm -hmm. you see similar, as, as I understand it, I can't read the original sources here, you see similar sort of solutions to step nomads um, in Han China, mm -hmm. which is contemporary um, right, with right. the Romans and is dealing with, uh, dealing with the other end of the step and step nomads, the Zhongnu. Mm -hmm. Um and it's just sort of similar things. They're projecting fire with uh, crossbows, usually, uh, as well as regular archers, um, using um, shields and pikes to keep the cavalry away, and then trying to counterattack with their own cavalry once mm -hmm. the once the enemy attack is exhausted. Um, yeah, step nomads are, are 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 rough and haven't been well represented um, in fiction. Uh, I know we're going to at some point transition to Game of Thrones. The Step Nomads <laughs> oh, right, in Game yeah. of Thrones are a trash fire mess. Um, the Dothraki. Mm -hmm. uh, really easily one of the worst elements of both the book and the series in terms of actually getting anywhere close to a real culture, mm -hmm. uh, which is unfortunate because the George R. R. Martin has like openly been like, these are like Mongols and Plains Native Americans. And I'm like, they are not actually <laughs> um there are a mass of your weird 1990s stereotypes about mongols and plains native americans which is really unfortunate <laughs> um but oh. anyway yeah well anyway oh yeah no that, that was very interesting um and actually it's a, a good segue to what i talk about next in some ways you know I, i've read that you know the battle of the pelinor fields uh, was inspired at least distantly by the battle of the Cal catalonian plains you know this famous engagement between uh, the romans and the visigoths and attila and the huns and you know the actual, the actual battle was quite different from what i understand you know that battle as far as we understand it from the sources um, but it does point up how tolkien is borrowing in some ways from late roman slash byzantine history um, for some of the things that he presents um, in Return of the King. And in particular, you know, Gondor seems to be this sort of pseudo late Roman culture, at least, you know, in comparison with, say, a Roham, just more of this, I don't know, Anglo-Saxon or Germanic kind of, you know, early medieval sort of society. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, you know, Minas Tirith is really Constantinople, uh, you know, made more aggressive with seven rings of walls, you know, and right. put up on a but, mountain. But impenetrable and, all the same. Exactly. And Penchable all the same, um, you know, Grand notwithstanding. And, uh, you know, thinking about how he, there's this, this atmosphere in the court of Denethor, for example, um, 
uh, about uh, this uh, this court. Uh, sorry, that this this atmosphere of decay um, that kind of pervades Gondor, uh, Minas Tirith. You know that they, they have every the Hall of the Steward, everything. It feels like it's uh, living in the shadow of what had been. And I think for people of Tolkien's generation who are reading Gibbon and you know other sources about Byzantium, this is a very natural sort of way to think about late Rome slash. Byzantium, or say Constantinople in the 13th century, you know, kind of living um, off the fumes of the Roman, <laughs> the, the Roman history. And so someone who approached, you know, if there's some hypothetical person who approached Byzantine history through Gondor, I don't know why you would, maybe you could though somehow, would have this profoundly misleading idea about what Byzantium was like, you know, this, uh, this very outmoded idea of Byzantium as this ghost or shell um, of the Roman Empire. And I wanted that to be our segue into, uh, at last, Westeros and George R. R. Martin, um, whose, you know, whose world of Westeros is supposed to be, anyway, this medieval-style world. Actually, purports to be um, this medieval world that's based, at least in theory, upon how the Middle Ages in Europe actually worked, at least at high, the high level of high politics. And you have this wonderful series about how Westeros is actually profoundly ahistorical um, on that basis, and about how everything from the armies of Westeros to the Church of Westeros has nothing to do with those of medieval, their, their medieval European counterparts. So you could elaborate a bit on how, why, how and why Westeros is in no way medieval. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we talked about all of these deep wells of experience that, that Tolkien <laughs> had. Um, it will not surprise you to learn that George R. R. Martin doesn't have any of those. Um, <laughs> he has at least read some um history of of medieval europe he is he is better when it comes to you know we might broadly be like western latin christendom mm -hmm. um which means that that westeros fares better than essos mm -hmm. um but there are still a lot of problems i mean he is he has himself confessed that he is bored by historical treatments of things like land tenure and <laughs> a good luck trying to understand the middle ages uh if you dismiss yeah. It's land true. tenure which is the sun of which all everything revolves right it's like mm -hmm. these guys are all competing for control over the peasants um so that the, the peasants are that they're the productive resource they're what matters um and so some things he does rather better and some things he does rather worse and then the show because let's be honest relatively few people have read a song of ice and fire compared to many many people who watched and were disappointed by the show mm -hmm. Um, the show magnifies every problem and fouls up many of the successes. And so mostly, you know, I've, I've treated, treated the show. Um, so I mean, sort of where, where to begin. I mean, I think, I think religion right. is probably, um, the best place to start. As I tell my students, people in the past generally believed their own religion. Uh, it's one of these sort of truisms that's obvious when you say it, but the implications <laughs> are significant. And, you know, Game of Thrones is a world in which no one appears to believe their own religion. That, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to pause anyone, for instance, that they they believe in these, in these gods. Um, they believe these gods govern an eternal afterlife. They believe that entrance to that afterlife is governed by moral behavior. This is the religion of the South, right? Rather than the old gods of the North. Mm -hmm. um, these are all of its sort of core tenets. And yet no one for a moment is like, hey, wait a minute, Tywin, would, would, would murdering all of these peasants actually interfere with my afterlife? Mm -hmm. And if that seems like an insane question, that was a frequent question in the, in the European Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. That was an almost obsession of the military aristocracy was how to balance this Christian religion, which in its text is nearly pacifist, um, with their social role as the administers of violence mm -hmm. um, for, for the community, um, where you get this very common delineation of society in medieval sources. It's almost a trope in medieval sources between those who work, those who fight, and those who pray. Mm -hmm. And, and the leaders of the society are those who fight. Um, and they're trying to square with this. Um, this is part of why crusading, when it appeared in the High Middle Ages, was so popular. It mm -hmm. appeared to square the circle. You can fight for God. Um, and one of the things students struggle with is, is the idea that like, most of the crusaders were there out of sincere religious conviction. Mm -hmm. This was armed pilgrimage. 
because they really believed their religion. Um, likewise, you get kings and dukes and counts who at the end of their long and successful careers retire and enter monasteries to pray for their immortal souls because they are legitimately worried. Mm -hmm. And, you know, apart from this business about the High Sparrow, we see nothing like this in Game of Thrones. No one seems to have these concerns. Everyone is all real politic all the time. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Europe proper, the church was often, the institutional church could be a break on violence. Um, we talk about two movements, the peace of God and the truce of God mm -hmm. um, in Europe. Uh, these never fully succeed. I don't want to oversell them. But these were religious efforts to define certain individuals as not appropriate targets for violence. Sort of some of the first efforts we ever see in the Mediterranean, uh, certainly in, in Europe, to sort of define non-combatants. Mm -hmm. um, though I should note that, it, that Islam also has is making an effort to define non-combatants. Um, by contrast, like the Romans do not have, there are no non-combatants oh, no. in Roman warfare, <laughs> not even a little bit. Um, that is not inside of their moral imagination. So this is this is this sort of two strains, um, and it comes in Islam a little earlier, um, these sort of two strains of efforts of religious efforts to define non-combatants because it is a matter of religion, not real politics. Um, and then there's also an effort to define certain days, like we shouldn't be killing each mm -hmm. other on high holy days. And this is an attempt to restrain violence. And there are even some churchmen who talk about the Crusades as an effort to export violence. It's not clear that that was ever a serious reason, but they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, as sort of the Crusades are like, let's take all this violence we have in our society and go put it over here, go put it in the Middle East where it, it can't damage our society. And mm -hmm. so these sort of concerns about violence that are motivated by the church, by religion, and are just completely not present in, in Westeros, right? The, the, the event that always got me was the Red Wedding, mm -hmm. um, which if done in the high middle ages would have been a real problem um, because, you know, you imagine you have a big royal wedding. Um, there is a, 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 a delegated representative of the church present, almost certainly would have been a bishop or an archbishop. And then you kill everyone. Um, enjoy excommunication, <laughs> right? I mean, like the church mm -hmm. is going to retaliate against that breach of its priorities. You've profaned a sacrament. Um, and indeed, if you look at Martin, will point to like these examples where this kind of thing happened. Um, and indeed, you will note they are all early modern examples. They mm -hmm. are all at the doorstep of or after the Protestant Reformation, which of course breaks the institutional power of the church. Um, uh, you know, um, and and often um, the particular the only example that actually happens at a wedding happens specifically in the conflict between Catholics and Huguenots, that is French Protestants mm -hmm. in France. Um, this is the Saint Bartholomew's Day Massacre. I think oh, is, right, the, right. is his name. Yeah, um, like it mattered that because there were Protestants at this wedding, the Church had removed its protection. The Pope mm -hmm. had declared this wedding invalid already. And so that religious protection wasn't present. Otherwise, as a Catholic monarch, you would be insane to challenge the church in such a direct way um, because the church could exert very real power among your vassals and supporters because they believe their own religion. Um, and so if the Pope tells them that this has damned them, th th mm -hmm. some of them are going to be really worried about that. And that just doesn't take place in Westeros at all. Um, and, and that actually goes for a lot of my analysis, especially as we get into the into the show, that the armies we see in terms of their size are much bigger than medieval armies. Um, they seem much more professional, um, mm -hmm. much more centrally directed, which makes them a lot more like early modern armies. They're much more destructive, which makes them a lot more like early modern armies. People tend to think of the Middle Ages had a lot of endemic warfare, but because mm -hmm. states were fragmented, weak, and poor, that endemic warfare tended to be of a smaller scale. And so its destructiveness was limited, not because everyone was nice, but because the tools for destruction <laughs> they had were limited. Mm -hmm. As we get into the early modern period, um, armies get bigger for a very complex set of reasons. We don't need to go in here. 
the armies get bigger. Mm -hmm. The logistics doesn't get any better, so rulers are struggling to pay and supply these armies. Armies that aren't paid or fed extract their food and money from whoever happens to be close to them because they have weapons. And mm -hmm. so these early modern armies move like almost elemental forces of destruction across the countryside, um, oversized and smashing into each other. Um, they're incredibly destructive. They're very effective at doing what the rulers want, which is fighting other people. But the collateral damage is massive. You know, this culminates, of course, in the early 1600s and the Thirty Years' right. War in, in Germany. Um, it kills maybe about a third of all the people in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, these wars are so destructive that you end up with depopulated zones where the armies have crisscrossed mm -hmm. them so many times that no one lives there anymore. Um, you see this um, in the Thirty Years' War. You also see this in the Eighty Years' War, um, which is the the Dutch War of Independence against mm -hmm. Spain. The Sp Spain controls most of what is today basically Belgium, and right. and then the the Dutch control what is today Netherlands. And the zone where the two met, you can actually look at maps from before the Eighty Years' War and after, and you can see that that zone was full of towns and villages before the war. And after, it's this strip of empty that runs across the map um, because these armies are incredibly destructive. And of course, the warfare in Westeros is portrayed as similarly destructive, destructive on a scale that medieval warfare wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I always find this frustrating because, I mean, one, I feel for my medievalist colleagues who have to just endlessly fight against this, <laughs> this popular notion that the Middle Ages was just a sort of worst time to be alive ever, um, which is unfair to the period. Um, but also, I think it gives us a false sense of security that like all of that bad stuff was back then. Um, mm -hmm. It's not now, right? It's not modern. It's medieval. I'm going to get medieval on you. <laughs> um, and it's like, you shouldn't worry if someone's going to get medieval on you. Take a look at Ukraine. Worry if someone's going to get modern on you. <laughs> modern yeah, war is yeah. much more destructive. Yeah, I know that, you know, Martin's often said that it was based in some way on the Wars of the Roses, you know, the, the Game of Thrones. But like you said, the Thirty Years' which War is a much better modern. analog. Which are, I guess that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, 15th century and all that, all that good stuff. Um, or even like, like the Wars of Louis XIV or something, right? Kind of these much right. bigger armies, you know, bawling away at each other. And, you know, everything in their path just gets even depopulated, yeah. like you said. And I thinking should, about I how right note, people... Mm -hmm. I should note... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh... Ask 10 historians when the Middle Ages end and the early oh, modern right. period begins. You will get 12 answers. But like at the very <laughs> least, we're talking about conflicts that are, if they're not in the early modern period, which some people will start in the 1400s, some people will start, a lot of this depends on whether or not you count the Renaissance as a separate period. Right. Um, you know, the Middle Ages end somewhere between 1400 and 1520, depending mm -hmm. on who you ask. Um, so we're we're on the doorstep of the early modern if we're not in it at um, very least, and, right? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, well, absolutely. Like I said, even that that uh, the nebulous nature of the period itself is interesting, which we could talk about a bit. But but thinking about how you said, you know, this point that seems so obvious but is so often overlooked that people actually believed their religion and respected, you know, its authorities and you know its scriptural authority in this case. You know, I think of course immediately as a Roman historian about you know Theodosius and Ambrose. Um, you know, where Theodosius kills, you know. 10,000 people, whatever, is in Thessalonica. And, you know, his bishop, you know, his court bishop, essentially, Ambrose, um, pretty much forces him to repent, you know, despite all the power of the Roman Empire. And despite the fact that this is really before the church is an institution nearly as powerful as it would become in the, in the high Middle Ages. And so there is this moral force that is just yeah. disregarded, um, you know, again and again um, in Game of Thrones. And so I guess we've kind of already begun to broach this, but, um, you know, why does it matter when a fictional world is presented in this sort of misleading way. You know, obviously, Westeros is not historical, um, but it becomes you know this sort of uh, I guess a gateway drug in some ways for history. Yeah, and so obviously, as you can tell, because I've read all of these things, I enjoy fantasy literature. I don't have a problem mm -hmm. with fantasy literature. Um, where where Game of Thrones draws a lot of my ire um, is that. There has been a tendency both by its creators and by its fans to assume that it is better grounded in history than it is. Mm -hmm. And this is the sort of fundamental, why should we uh, look at these works critically as historians, as students of history? Well, because the popular consciousness about the Middle Ages is going to be more heavily shaped by Game of Thrones in our generation than anything any historian writes. Mm -hmm. um, and 
and in this case, right, it is mostly misinforming rather than informing. Um, and the new series doesn't seem to be doing much better, uh, given what the show, I haven't managed to watch episode one yet, but, um, but the, given what the showrunners are saying, um, you know, I don't, I'm not expecting much better. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, there's apparently a lot of emphasis on, on sort of patriarchy and, and gender roles, which is always baffling to me that I'm like, compared to the early modern period or the ancient world, women in the Middle Ages had relatively more latitude in society, um, mm -hmm. in part because, um, you know, through particularly convents um, and, and other forms of, of religious activity, women could wield soft forms of religious power, even as they were sort mm -hmm. of kept out of the Catholic hierarchy. Um, but like, for instance, there are women rulers all over Europe in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to present the Middle Ages as sort of this uniquely backwards time in terms of the, the rights and position of women, it's just really weird to me that I'm like, what, you know, uh, that's not, I'm like, this is a, it's certainly not, a, it's still a patriarchal society, don't get me wrong, but, but women did wield real influence in these societies in a way that, that, you know, the sort of Game of Thrones wants to sort of repeatedly hammer the, like, this was the worst time. And I'm like, it, it wasn't, though. Mm -hmm. um, but that influences our thinking about both the past and the present. If we think that we can confine this violence and warfare and gender inequality and all of, all of these things to the past, these are medieval, they are not present. It both mm -hmm. distorts our understanding of the Middle Ages. It also distorts our understanding of the present. It gives us an unearned sense of security in our advances that I think is is also just as dangerous, that a good student of history would be, be wary of accepting the idea that we have, um, you know, put all of these demons in boxes and never may they harm us again. That's no, mm -hmm. um, you know, no indeed. Um, and so, um, and so I think it is, I think it is really important because these works um, do influence the public consciousness and, I think that the creators of these works to a degree have a responsibility of representation in mm -hmm. terms of how they present their work. And part of what continually frustrates me about uh, Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones is that, you know, Martin is very deliberately, the showrunners have very deliberately presented as like, this is grounded, this is realistic, um, mm -hmm. often in explicit contrast to The Lord of the Rings, which I find ironic. Um, because I think Tolkien actually has a better grasp of the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, and people accept that. Um, they don't know any better. They're not historians. And I find that, frankly, frustratingly irresponsible um, to sort of, sort of, uh, you know, if you want to have your magical world with dragons that's made up, that's fine. But then just say it's made up. Don't mm -hmm. say that, well, this is like the War of the Road. Is it, though? Um, and, uh, and so I think that that, that claim is made, um, without the oomph to back it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess that, that's, that's a very important point, you know, so if you're going to make this claim that it's historical in some general sense, right, you know, have, have substance to that claim. And, and so I suppose, you know, a lot of different genres, different media do make this claim in some ways, whether it's video games, um, you know, whether it's in TV or in, in cinema, so I guess if you're going to make the claim that your show is in some sense inspired by a historical period or place, um, what sorts of details is it important or most important to get right in your opinion? You know, what matters most if you're trying to get to convey a period accurately? A broad question, I know, but uh, your sense of that. Yeah, I think you want to build your knowledge of the period up from the foundation. You know, I... I... I dinged Martin at the beginning of this for not reading about land tenure, but you need to start by mm -hmm. reading about land tenure. Um, that sort of, of understanding of how is the society organized, including the little people, um, is, is extremely important. And if you're going to try and, and, and get an accurate sense of, of how these things work, because almost everything builds up from that basis, there needs to be an attention towards... Um, the realia of of day-to-day -day life and the values of these people. And of course, the tricky thing is there really is no shortcut to getting a sense of a society's values other than just mm -hmm. reading a lot of their sources. Um, 
you know, I mean, this is this is one of the things that I think a historian brings to the table that if you marinate in whether it's old English literature like Tolkien or, you know, if you just read a ton of Livy, you eventually get a sense of sort of how this or that society thinks, how they view the world. Um, and you often find, and this is something I point out to my students, that they view the world quite differently than we do. Mm -hmm. um, and their values are often quite different from ours. And that's one of the great fascinating realizations of history um, and one of the places where a lot of these works fall down, that they sort of inject modern people into ancient systems mm -hmm. and then wonder why they don't quite work right. Um, you know, again, the, believing their own religion is, is, a, is a good example. And one thing that becomes just evidently true as you read the sources is that, you know, people in the ancient world, like the Romans believed Jupiter was a thing. Mm -hmm. And that he really influenced events and that he could be, his opinion could be turned, he could be gotten onto your side and that that was good. And they behaved accordingly. Like they lose battles and they're like, we lost this battle, Publius Claudius Polker, because you <laughs> right. chucked the sacred chickens. <laughs> like it wasn't fleet disposition. It wasn't maneuver. You did mm -hmm. the religion wrong and therefore we lost. And we're going to, mm -hmm. I mean, they say he, he, he's charged. He's tried. Oh, yeah. Um, not for his bad generalship, but for his sacrilege. Um, that is a sort of a piece of the culture that really you have to marinate in the sources a little bit mm -hmm. to get. Um, but I mean, I would encourage authors to do so. I think part of what makes the Lord of the Rings stand out so much from so much other fantasy literature is that it's dumbness. And so occasionally characters have those value sets mm -hmm. and they're so discordant that it creates that feeling of, of wonderful alien otherworldliness. The mm -hmm. Rohirrim sing with joy as they charge into battle. And people like, that's incredibly weird. And I'm like, you should read Bertrand de Born, um, mm -hmm. who is a, 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 a French, technically an Occitan troubadour, mm -hmm. um, who writes songs and poems, among other things, about how much he likes war. Um, no chicken hawk he. He is a baron. He is a knight. He is a warrior. This is a guy that has mm -hmm. been in a lot of battles and would like to be in some more. <laughs> um, there's a political positioning. He is trying to egg his faction into a fight that he wants that would be advantageous for him. But obviously, he thinks his audience is receptive. He has this mm -hmm. wonderful poem, um, uh, I Like the Springtime, um, where it, it begins with a bit of a joke um, that he opens it up with, like, I like the springtime when the flowers are going. And this is a standard way to begin because troubadours do a, a array of kind of different genres. A standard mm -hmm. way to begin the kind of romance genre and then he just pivots and he's like, because all the tents are in the field and the army's ready to go. And then the rest of the poem is, is, is martial imagery. And he's like, you know, mm -hmm. I love seeing our foragers burning their way across the countryside and our knights charging mm -hmm. and, you know, getting hit and taking a hit in return and the broken lances and everything. But like, there's an element here that's sincere this is a society that views combat not as some bizarre moral aberration, but as a normal part of life. Mm -hmm. The same way for the, the Romans through the Republic, service in the army is how boys become men. Mm -hmm. um, it was normal. If you didn't do it, something was wrong with you. And that's just a very different way of viewing the world. And mm -hmm. that can be a hard sense to get, but um, but I would encourage some of these authors to, to get it. Just... Uh, I'll, I'll plug a book here for the readers. If you want to get a sense of Roman martial values, the book you want to read is Ted Lendon's Soldiers and Ghosts. Oh, yes. I, I second that. That's a great book. Fantastic book. Um, but it will bootstrap you through reading a whole lot of ancient sources to get you like, this is how their value system works, both the Greeks and the Romans. And you will find their value system is very alien to yours, I am guessing. Dear listener. <laughs> yeah. well, one hopes, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, dude, I'd love to go tilt, you know. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, well, that's, that, yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good point. I think, of course, like even like, like the Greek poetry, like, like a Tertius or something, you know, celebrating the hoplite phalanx, you know, or, or Aeschylus putting his shield on marathon. shield, crest on shield crest, on shield. standing exactly. in the line, taking blows. Exactly, right. Um, yeah, it, it, it is celebrated unambiguously, you know, that they truly think this is the way that, you know, to celebrate, this is the way to be a man, to be a Spartan or to be a Greek, whatever it might be, um, or a Roman, of course. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, but of anyway, course, the thing about uh, and the thing about Tertius, just because I also have a series where I dismantle the myth of Sparta. Um, uh, yes. Um, and the thing about Tertius is, like, obviously he is a Spartan, and you know, of course, but mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that sort of pro martial value is not unique to Sparta. I'm always no, no, reminded of, of the epitaph of of Aeschylus. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Aeschylus was the greatest playwright of his generation and recognized as such. He had been mm -hmm. the winningest playwright to have ever lived and we have his epitaph and he doesn't mention his plays at all it's like mm -hmm. here lies aeschylus he ran at marathon the persians can tell you how well he fought that's mm -hmm. it it's done right exactly that's what he wants it, you to know mm -hmm. this is this is the equivalent of like i mean i can't i can't even imagine um this would, this would be like frank capra's grave and all it has is he made some movies for the war department <laughs> right. That's or, the only thing you need to know. Yeah, or Tolkien. Or to yeah, Tolkien. Tolkien's yeah, yeah. grave. Yeah, exactly. I right. fought at the Somme. Yeah, and that's the only too. thing written on exactly. it. Exactly. Right? That right, would be right. wild. But this uh -huh. is what Aeschylus does, um, mm -hmm. which gives you a real sense of what he thought was important. Like what he wanted you to know is, I fought at Marathon. I mm -hmm. ran across that field, and that is the event that defines me, not the mm -hmm. fact that. You know, I, I happen to write all these wonderful plays and all these wonderful plays, and I just yeah. For folks who who are, are are, I mean, I'm guessing most of your listeners are fairly familiar with classical literature. But I mean, if you're not, like, I cannot express enough how much Aeschylus was a titan of the genre when he died. Mm -hmm. He really um, invented it in some ways. Yeah, you know, I mean, so, just, yeah. and this is just, and of course, a lot of his plays are preserved to not nearly all of them, but many of them mm -hmm. are preserved today. Right, <laughs> copied over thousands of years right, because right. Of how excellent they are. Um, and he doesn't even mention it. It mm -hmm. isn't even. He doesn't even say like Aeschylus the playwright. He's like Aeschylus the son of so and so, and then we're yeah. to marathon. Just was hardcore it's at marathon. Yeah, um, yeah, or, right. Or even Socrates, you know, being at the Battle of Delium or whatever Adelium. else, you know, that that, that yeah. just unambiguously presented in Plato. Like, yep, he was a great, great hoplite. You know, philosopher too. But you know, this is the thing that presents him as being, you know, when the army person. fell apart, he kept his head, organized some guys, and got them off the exactly. field. Exactly. Right, yes. Yeah. Right. That's showing. Right, you know, and, that's showing yeah. his his you know his sophrosune, right? His his uh -huh. wisdom. Exactly. Yeah. So this, how even philosophy is so intertwined with these martial virtues. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, uh, we, we covered uh, some wonderful topics today. Um, so, so Brett and uh, a wide range of topics too, which is always great. Um, so, so Brett, thanks so much. I really appreciate. Well, thanks it. for having me. This was a fantastic conversation. Well, it was. Um, and so, for anyone who's not encountered it before, um, a collection of unmitigated pedantry um, is a wonderful series of reads. I highly recommend it. Uh, just Google it, and there you'll be right there. Um, and of course, if you haven't seen it before, Told the Stone, the YouTube channel, you know, check it out. But uh, in any case, uh, Brett, thanks again. And to everyone, thanks for listening.